Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the UNC School of Medicine, I welcome you and thank you all for joining us for this, the annual Norma Berryhill Distinguished Lecture. Uh, this special event has always been a high point for the UNC medicine community, and it's become our fall convocation. It represents the start of our academic year, and it reaffirms our commitment to scholarship, to our students, to our faculty, and to the very collegiality the Barry Hills left as a legacy to all of us. As many of you know, I'm sure this lectureship recognizes a highly cherished individual, Norma Berryhill, who along with her distinguished husband, Dr. Walter Reese Berryhill, contributed immeasurably to the development of this institution, to the recruitment of an outstanding faculty, and to the enhancement of the collegial ambience that characterizes Chapel Hill. Indeed, Norma and Reese Berryhill hold an exalted place in the School of Medicine's history. Dr. Reese Berryhill, for his monumental accomplishments as medical school dean for almost a quarter century, from 1940 to 1964. His distinguished tenure included the expansion of the medical school to four years and the building of the North Carolina Memorial Hospital. And Ms. Norma Berryhill, his partner, is remembered for her love, loyalty, quiet wisdom, strength, and support. Ms. Berryhill has been described by someone as, quote, the principal architect and engineer for the School of Medicine and for this medical center. She nurtured, nurtured generations of students and provided guiding wisdom for all the deans and for this, we are tremendously grateful. I'd ask you please now to join me in offering our gratitude for all that the Berry Hills have done for us. <laughs> With us this evening is Ms. Kat Will Berry Hill Williams. Kat, we're delighted to have you. Please stand so we can recognize you. And I want to recognize uh, our speaker's family, uh, Dr. Catherine Falk, and their children, Christine, Ben, and John. Would you all please stand? Let me now introduce Dr. Dick Krasno, who chairs the board of the healthcare system. Dr. Krasno, please. And I'm looking around and haven't yet seen him, but I'm told that Dr. Don Budins, our new chair of the Department of Ophthalmology, might be with us. Today is his first day on the job, so I <laughs> hope he showed up. Is Dr. Budins here so we can recognize you? Anyhow, let me now turn to introducing my boss, Chancellor Holden Thorpe. Uh, Holden is someone well known to all of you, I'm sure, but I think it's important to for each of us to remember that Holden brings to this important and challenging job the expertise of a scientist, the proven leadership uh, of an academic statesman who is an able steward of our future, and especially he is my good friend, Holden Thorpe. Thank you, Bill, very much. It's great to be here. I look forward to coming here all the, uh, every year. And I uh, was informed when I arrived here that Gary Park has announced his candidacy for athletic director. <laughs> so those of you who think that that's a good idea, I can get you the email address of the committee if you want to write to them. Um, it's uh, Likewise, Bill Roper is a great friend and colleague. and. Um, it's great to see the School of Medicine and the healthcare system in the wonderful shape that they're in. Uh, it's a huge help to us that in these difficult times that we've been in, that our academic units continue to succeed at the level that they have uh, and that the hospital continues to be uh, well managed and to do such a great job of providing care to uh, North Carolinians. It was a tough summer for the budget, and I just want to say a little bit about that since I've 
got you all here and I can kind of tell you what our strategy is going to be going forward. We did take a permanent cut to our state appropriation of $100 million this year. Uh, that's a number that if you had said to us um, at some abstract time that we would be cutting that amount, we would probably say that's impossible. Uh, but the good work of all of the financial people uh, in the schools and in South Building uh, made it so that we were able to do that smoothly. And while it was painful, it's, um, it's a testament to the extraordinary capability of a lot of our coworkers that um, we didn't have any major hiccups in, um, administratively in getting that done. As you know, the university's uh, $100 million cut was offset in part by a $20 million transfer from the healthcare system. Uh, and that is uh, important, I think, for the School of Medicine and the university and um, the UNC system and the relationship, the interrelationship that all of those entities uh, have managed, in my opinion, so well uh, the last several years under Bill's leadership and with Tom Ross and, and Erskine Bowles. The interdependence of the university and the School of Medicine and the healthcare system are critical, and we have uh, done, I think, as I talk to my colleagues around the country, as good a job or better than uh, most of our peers at handling the situation there that we're in by depending on each other. And that's the kind of thing that we have to do in the situation that we're in. Um, and even in the face of that, we had a great year in research with um, $788 million in research grants for the campus last year. Um, if you take the total from the previous year and subtract the federal stimulus funding, uh, we had $677 million uh, the year before. So we don't know how that's going to stack up nationally, but my guess is we'll move up um, compared to many of our peers. And the School of Medicine share of the $788 million was $390 million. So thank you for your talent and your perseverance and your ability to write 25 pages of single-spaced eight-point type uh, <laughs> and have it favorably reviewed by your peers around the country. Uh, it is no, nobody, uh, no one who has not done that understands how challenging it is. And so uh, um, thank you for all your hard work. Uh, we also had a great year in private support, 277 million uh, in private gifts, which is our second highest total ever. Uh, the only year that was more than that was the last year of our campaign. So we're pleased with that. And the pledges plus gifts which uh, we to total up as new commitments was 305 million. So that's a, those are uh, extraordinary accomplishments. Um, the campus maintained its uh, ranking among the public research universities in the US News and World Report. We're in the top five for the 11th year in a row. And the School of Medicine's recognition in multiple areas was outstanding, second in primary care, and in a new ranking, we're the eighth most popular medical school. Uh, having gone to college here with lots of people who wanted to go to our medical school, I could have told the world that we were a very popular medical school, but apparently, as always, the U.S. News has figured a way to quantitate uh, that. But um, unfortunately, in the U.S. News rankings, we fell 12 spots in faculty resources, uh, which doesn't really put us in a bad place among public universities. We're 59th in faculty research sources, which doesn't sound that good, but we're tied with Michigan. And we're fourth among the public campuses. But the discouraging thing is that two years ago we were 35th and then 47th and now 59th. So when you take th this trend and you look at the fact that we're doing such a good job uh, with um, our private fundraising, that our grants are so good, and that the healthcare system is prospering, you can see that we've, we've exhausted just about every trick that we have at our disposal to try to figure out how to maintain the quality of what we're doing going forward. And we can't afford to have um, our standing and faculty retention and, and faculty resources slip any further. And so you know, we need to do the best job possible at explaining to our external stakeholders and our internal folks that we, we have more than done our part 
to acknowledge the fact that the state is in a difficult financial situation. We need our political supporters to, to realize that. And while tuition for undergraduates especially is a last resort for us, we're, we're reaching the point where we may need to uh, we may need to go to our last resort. So over the next several months, the time has come for us to collectively make the case that maintaining the quality of what we have achieved and the ability to produce a lecturer like you're gonna to hear today is our top priority. And that doing our part and acknowledging the fact that the state is in a difficult position and achieving great savings through cutting administration and looking at every last source of revenue, we've done all those things. And we're, we need the people of North Carolina to reaffirm their commitment to higher education, which is historic and has gotten us to the point where we are now. Um, just a few other milestones about uh, your work, which we're also proud of. The patient satisfaction goals uh, were reached in all of the, uh, for UNC hospitals. And, um, of course, we did very well on our uh, the CMS's HCAP survey, um, which most of you know measures patient satisfaction based on their perceptions on leaving the hospital. And in fact, UNC was the highest of all of the Triangle hospitals throughout the year, and at one point was ranked number one in all 10 of the HCAP's measures in the Triangle. We're all, I'm also very proud to be associated with a uh, hospital that has, been, has received magnet designation for its nursing program from the American Nurses Credentialing Center, and I'd just like to give everybody who contributed to that a round of applause. <laughs> it's been a privilege seeing Mary and her colleagues and all the great work that we do. Um, only 6% of all U.S. hospitals have earned, have earned magnet de designation. Since Mike Cohen's here, I can't uh, sit down without talking about our inspiring trip to Malawi that Patty and I made to see the extraordinary work that we do there in HIV and um, you know those of you who haven't had a chance to go see uh, Global Health in Action, I strongly encourage you to do that. It's one of the most inspiring uh, experiences that you can have in academic life. And um, our work in, in HIV continues to amaze the world and I think you all know that David Margolis got an enormous um, grant to lead a national effort in eradicating HIV, and of course Mike's group has ma made a number of exciting announcements, and the kind of multidisciplinary approach that we see in this kind of work is the kind of thing that uh, makes it a privilege to lead uh, your university. And getting to come here, Ron Falk give his talk is also uh, a, a great privilege and something I've been looking forward to. And so um, with that, I just thank you for all you do for Carolina uh, and for all you do for the School of Medicine and for UNC Hospitals and to Bill Roper and his team. Uh, thank you for making today possible. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Bill. Thank you, Holden. We appreciate your splendid leadership on our collective behalf. And now let me introduce Bud Harper, who's Associate Dean for Medical Alumni Affairs, to bring greetings from the Alumni Association. Good afternoon. Um, Chancellor Thorpe, uh, Dean Roper, Cat Berry Hill, guests, fellow faculty. Ordinarily, uh, this privilege is given to the uh, president of our Medical Alumni Association, but unfortunately, uh, complications and uh, other commitments have uh, prevented uh, Dr. Joseph Jenkins from doing this. Uh, in a way, I'm very pleased that uh, he was unable to come because it it gives me a chance to, uh, to uh, not beat my drum, but to, to say what a wonderful experience that I have had uh, as an employee of the university for, I'm now in my 45th year. So uh, it's, it's time that I should say some of these things. 
we always have this event to honor a great lady uh, who we have considered the first lady of the School of Medicine for many, many years. But it's more than just to honor Ms. Berryhill. And we hear this repeated from whoever takes the podium here, that it's, it's the school and it's the spirit that we really are here to honor. And this encompasses, encompasses heritage, legacy, and tradition. It is also the showcase of our most distinguished faculty. And we're very pleased that Ron Falk is with us today to continue that show of excellence. I've tried very hard to think about the perks of growing old. Um, and there aren't very many. Uh, one of them is if you live long enough, you get to see history unfold. And if you're lucky enough, you even may be a part of that history. Uh, I'm privileged to say that I think I fall into that category. Having been here as long as I have, it could hardly miss. Another perk uh, that I found out was that as you age, you're given some reasonable license to be able to remember and to reminisce. And I beg your indulgence to allow me to do this today. In the fall of 1956, I entered the graduate school in medicine here, and my dean was Dr. Walter Reese Berryhill. There are not a lot of people here that can say that. I know Jim Bryan has been here a long time, but he didn't originate here, so I, I think I do hold one I see him out in the audience somewhere. There he is. Dr. Berryhill was my dean for the next four years. Norma Berryhill was our first lady, and she was the godmother to all the students, all the house staff, and all the faculty. The level of congeniality and collegiality that the Berryhill family portrayed is unbelievable. Many happy hours were spent at their home on, off of Smith Level Road where uh, fun times were had by all. I was very fortunate uh, that in the, later in my career, Dr. Berryhill asked if I would be his personal physician and, and later Cat asked me the same thing. I think it was that point in my career that I realized that my uh, diploma had been authenticated because Dr. Berryhill's name was at the bottom of that diploma and for that I would be forever appreciative. Cat is a contemporary in college and Cat and my wife Farrell Ann are sorority sisters so we've had a close relationship with the Berryhill family for many years. Uh, to point this out, when my wife and I built our home out on George King Road in South Durham County, and it's the only thing I don't like about it, I have to put down Durham as my home address, but when we, when we built the house, Dr. Berryhill was kind enough to give us five cuttings from his most prized miniature English boxwoods. Being the person, type of person that he was, he always gave good advice. And he suggested that I plant these boxwood cuttings over the septic system. Uh, it was obvious as to why, because I had to do very little in order to maintain the integrity of those boxwoods that we now call the Berry Hill Biddies. These were ageless memories, and I'm glad to be able to report them. These are things that perhaps you don't read in the book, and you may not know about all of this, but I've got to turn to Ron Falk now. I actually knew Ron before he knew me. I knew of Ron, and how did this happen? Well, I was fortunate enough to be the personal physician for Ron's dad. Dr. Eugene Falk. Dr. Falk was a great man. 
He was large in stature, spoke with a very deep voice, and I'm sure if he was in the choir, he was a bass singer. And he had a very obvious and somewhat strong Eastern European accent. His heavy mustache and his uh, glasses that he wore spoke of his distinguished appearance as a professor in the Department of Romance Languages at the university. I could tell that he was a disciplinarian, but he was a very patient man, and he was truly gentle. He was always very proud of Ron and spoke of him with extreme pride all of the time. I think that he would be very proud of Ron today, and I'm sure that he would. Ron, uh, the selection committee always has a difficult job in ferreting through the recommendations for the speaker at this event. And last year was no, no less a task, but the committee was extremely impressed with the nominating letters and with the record that Ron had developed in a relatively short period of time. And I think that the fact that he was from our midst uh, had a great deal to do, aside from all of the accolades that he has obtained over this period of time. Ron is truly an outstanding scholar. He's an accomplished scientist. He's a teacher of superb quality and indeed a clinician that we should all try to emulate. One more little vignette. Uh, recently, Kathy and I, I was invited by Kathy to have lunch. Uh, we go back a long way. I remember Kathy when she came from the wilds of West Virginia to UNC hospitals as a house officer outstanding, intellectual in her own right, and a perfect mate for Ron. She was extremely effusive in her feeling and happiness for Ron and made the statement, it's wonderful to see him wake up every morning loving his work and happy to go and look after other people. I don't know a better attribute than a wife could give to her husband. I tried very hard to uh, make an analogy about Ron, and I've already alluded to the fact that I've been very successful in maintaining the integrity of Dr. Barry Hill's boxwoods. But I am an amateur gardener, and this is sort of the source of my analogy for Ron. I'll give an estimate. Some 50 years ago, a seed was planted in the garden of Chapel Hill. That seed was nurtured by some very prominent and important people, and it grew to be a seedling. The seedling burst through the earth and became a very healthy plant. That plant grew a blossom, and, and from that blossom, came a prize big boy tomato. <laughs> now, I asked Kathy, <laughs> I asked Kathy about this analogy and she gave me her approval. So Ron, you can, you can speak with Kathy about that. With all analogies aside, as I said earlier, it's all about heritage it's about legacy and tradition, and today we are fortunate to get a full dose of it. Ron and I will probably never appear on the television screen in the Dean Dome, and we probably will never appear on the television screen in Keenan Stadium. But there's one thing I've always wanted to be able to say in public, yes, we are a Tar Heel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Bud. Nicely done. I'm now pleased to introduce the 2011 Norma Berry Hill Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Ron Falk. An expert in kidney disease and vasculitis, Ron has trained and practiced medicine at UNC for more than 30 years. Admired by all for his research, teaching, and patient care, he's known nationally and internationally for his expertise in the basic sciences and clinical observations of immune mechanisms of glomerular and vascular injury and his work on the study of anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibodies. I did it. <laughs> <clears throat> and their association with small vessel vasculitis. Ron was recruited to UNC in 1993 by Dr. Fred Sparling to serve as chief of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension. Soon afterward, he was named the Doc J. Thurston Distinguished Professor, and under his leadership, the UNC Kidney Center was formed in 2005. It's world-renowned for its contributions in the area of autoimmune glomerulonephritis. Our UNC Pathology Chair, Dr. Charles Jeanette, describes Ron as not only an exceptional scientist and clinician, but he adds that Ron is perhaps an even better teacher and mentor. He said, quote, I have never observed anyone whom I thought was more effective than Ron, especially in small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. This is true whether he's teaching clinical concepts to medical students or residents, or mentoring graduate students or postdoctoral fellows in research, unquote. Ron has done a number of very innovative things. For example, his use now of podcasts allows him to educate patients well beyond Chapel Hill in the management of their health and living with kidney and vasculitis, kidney disease and vasculitis. Ron joined Dr. Jeanette in the 1980s to form the Glomerular Disease Collaborative Network, which was created to coordinate kidney disease research by nephrologists throughout the southeastern U.S and to connect them with our School of Medicine. In, in 2008, Ron played an, an instrumental role in securing our Clinical and Translational Science Award from the NIH and in designing and now operating the North Carolina Translational and Clinical Sciences Institute. Dr. Falk is currently incoming president of the American Society of Nephrology. Ron has publications on improving the diagnosis and, tr and treatment of kidney disease. He's also served on or chaired various review panels, advisory boards, and a number of NIH study sections. His service nationally and at UNC is legendary. Most recently here at our campus, he chaired our just completed pediatrics chair search. Simply put, Ron Falk epitomizes what makes Carolina medicine great. He's an eminent scientist, a great teacher, a renowned clinician, and a leader in all areas. We are each better because of his being among us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our 2011 Berry Hill lecturer, Dr. Ron Falk. And it is the first time that I have been compared to a tomato. <laughs> Could have been other things, so the tomato bun was substantially better, and I thank you. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Thorpe, Dean Roper, the Berry Hill family, friends, colleagues, and the Berry Hill committee. But I want to make special mention of James Buddy Harper. Yes, we have known each other for a very long time. Uh, I think all of you should know that Buddy is retiring, or at least stopping what he's currently doing in June of this coming year, and we all owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. He has helped so many of us, so many people, so many patients. Buddy, job well done. Thank you so much. I begin at the conventional close with the acknowledgments. My family and colleagues are my foundation and sustaining force. This is especially true of my wife, Catherine, 
and my children, Benjamin, Christine, and John, who have graced me with constant compassion, everlasting love, and reality testing so necessary for ground wiring. Uh, my work family has similarly uh, enriched me with any number of wonderful colleagues and trainees. Uh, it's so wonderful to be able to interact with young trainees. Uh, there have been numerous over the course of the last quarter century. And my colleagues and trainees have really enriched this experience for me and for everyone. In particular, I am indebted to Charles Jeanette. I have uh, found him a mentor, a friend, a constant source of stimulation, and with whom I have written hundreds of manuscripts. I am also a very proud graduate of this school, of the internal medicine program, of the nephrology training program, and I have spent my entire career at this wonderful institution. Kathy and I have had the opportunity to look the world over. And the grass is really greener, and the sky really is Carolina bluer here in Chapel Hill. My studies began in Berry Hill Hall, which you'll see right there, if I can get this little machine to work, right there. Uh, and it was in that environment, that warm and collegial environment, that the essence of the University of North Carolina became so palpably evident. It is this congenial atmosphere and the fertile environment that it engenders that really makes Carolina special. This then really is the Berry Hill legacy of collegiality and hospitality that makes Carolina special an environment most formative and critical to all that our team has accomplished. So today I want to consider a subject that I feel is essential to the fabric of academic healthcare centers. The critical need for a vigorous climate of creativity. The word creativity comes from a Latin word creo, or to create or to make, and theories of creativity focus on the four Ps, product, person, place, and process. The climate of creativity word choice stems then from what I'd like to concentrate on, that fourth P, the climate of creativity that really allows creative forces to flourish. On the one hand, a climate of creativity is really essential to the success of people who want to do translational research. On the other hand, the leveling of the technological playing field between academic and non-academic hospitals makes essential of a climate of creativity for an academic hospital. It is my hope that in the next minutes, I can convince you of the veracity of both of these statements. Translational research seeks to diminish the gap between basic science and clinical care, and is the uh, focus of considerable attention both on a national level as well as locally, and this is really appropriate. It's appropriate because of the explosive uh, progress in both basic and clinical sciences, and the hope then is to have an efficient transfer of that material, that knowledge, to our patients. This process, however, really requires a climate that will align those who wish to do translational research willing patients, and a supportive healthcare environment. To best exemplify this balance, what I'd like to do is to tell you our own research efforts and use them as a focal point for the discussion. Patients with vasculitis have inflamed blood vessels. In the past, their diagnosis and underlying cause of disease was mired in a world of eponyms and dismal outcomes. Well, our involvement in the vasculitis field began with a patient of the late pediatric nephrologist, Dr. Richard Morris. This was a 15-year-old girl who presented to our hospital in 1985, coughing up blood 
with severe kidney disease, glomerulonephritis, glomerulonephritis, glomeruli are filtering units of the kidney. They are small little blood vessels and she had a horrible case of this. Remarkably, at the same period of time in The Lancet, there was an article suggesting that a form of vasculitis was associated with an unusual autoantibody that reacted with normal human neutrophils. Neutrophils are white blood cells, the cells that are otherwise called pus cells, and we dribbled this 15-year-old's blood on neutrophils, I believe they came from Charlie Jeanette, and the observation that we saw there by immunofluorescence microscopy, what is now known as anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic autoantibodies, ANCA, or ANCA for short, since even Bill Roper has trouble stumbling over that acronym. Much of clinical medicine is really based on descriptive studies, uh, on clinical and pathological findings, on natural history and response to therapy, and vasculitis was really no different. It was difficult to diagnose. There were numerous overlapping syndromes, and at times the diagnosis would take months to years. The association of a biomarker with any disease typically changes the calculus of the disease and the clinical utility of ANCA testing did just that. But the history of vasculitis has much to teach us today. Our investigative forefathers displayed remarkable curiosity with respect to individual cases. Let me give you some examples. A Hans Eppinger, who was a German pathologist, recovered the tissue from a patient 35 years earlier and described probably the first histology of vasculitis. In 1866, Kussmaul and Mayer, two whose pictures and busts adorn their medical school, uh, separated small from middle-sized vasculitis on the basis of only two patients. We have still much to learn about thinking about each patient, each interaction. Over the course of the next half century or so, the understanding of vasculitis proceeded pretty much by more precise descriptors of the pathology and clinical care. It was, however, in 1954 that a pathologist by the name of Jacob or Jack Churg realized that these vasculitides that had a number of confusing names were morphologically and pathogenetically related, and he was right. Fast forward to the 1980s and 1990s. The discovery of ANCA in patients with small vessel vasculitis occurred pretty quickly. The initial descriptions of these autoantibodies actually came from Australia when a pathologist recognized the association of the Ross River virus with this funny neutrophil staining pattern. The seminal observations of the late Professor Foucault van der Waddy that was, were published in The Lancet in 1985 were those that really triggered our own interest in these diseases and our findings then that these small, that ANCA were associated with a wide variety of small vessel vasculitides and further study was that one of these autoantibodies reacted with a neutrophil protein known as myeloperoxidase or the protein that makes pus green. Quite quickly thereafter, the other ANCA serotype, cytoplasmic ANCA, were described specifically with respect to the target antigen, and that turned out to be another protein that was first described in the Netherlands and quickly by us, otherwise known as proteinase 3. And I show you both cytoplasmic ANCA and perinuclear ANCA. My spouse tells me she kills still after hearing me for 30 years, can't tell the difference, but trust me. There is a difference between myeloperoxidase and proteinase 3 ANCA. We now know a tremendous amount about these two autoantibodies. 
myeloperoxidase or MPO ANCA and proteinase 3 or PR3 ANCA. And with modern technology, we are really hard pressed to find any patients with what are called posse immune small vessel vasculitides that don't have this biomarker, who don't have this serological test. And these two autoantibodies have now become the basis of a serologic or diagnostic test available throughout the world. No longer do we have to wait, then, for patients to present with protean manifestations of disease, symptomatology, and serious physical manifestations. Rather, the morbidity and mortality associated with these diseases has been diminished as a consequence of much easier diagnosis. It was in the early 1990s that we began to investigate the question of whether these were more than serological markers of disease. Could they actually cause vasculitis? It turns out that the answer to that question is yes, they do. What we were interested in is how this happened. What we think occurs is that these autoantibodies find their cognate antigens, myeloperoxidase or proteinase 3, shown in the yellow triangles, on the surface of the cell. And then upon this interaction of antibody and antigen, neutrophils and monocytes do what neutrophils and monocytes are supposed to do. They have a respiratory burst, producing bleach into the microenvironment, and release a whole host of noxious other processes. And it turns out that we and now the international community have shown that ANCA do activate neutrophils and then do hurt the endothelium or the lining of small blood vessels. The kinds of studies that we've performed here really rely on the phenomenal expertise, insights, and collegiality of our basic science faculty. And I want to provide some examples of this. From the outset, we realized that the autoantibody had to see its antigen in order for this activation process to occur. Myeloperoxidase and proteinase 3 are hidden inside of cells. And there are probably a number of ways that this could occur. And while studying neutrophils from patients with a variety of autoimmune diseases, and that's what's fun about studying humans, we stumbled across an unusual finding. All of your neutrophil genes are supposed to be silent, quiet, in bed, left alone. But in patients with ANCA disease, when compared to patients who have lupus, systemic lupus, another autoimmune disease, or rheumatoid arthritis, or healthy patients, there was a different gene signature, red upregulated, green downregulated, and interestingly enough, two of the genes that were turned on were the autoantigen genes, myeloperoxidase and proteinase 3. It turns out these genes are coordinately being turned on, even though they're on two separate chromosomes. And through collaboration with our marvelous genetics crowd, we've discovered that the turning on or turning off of these autoantigen genes is really a consequence of epigenetic control. That control that turns on, silences, or activates a gene. These studies have much to do with normal biology, but they've also taught us what might be occurring when patients with ANCA disease have active disease or in remission. We've got a substantial amount left to do in this area, but these observations have had a broader impact on all autoantibody-induced disease. Perhaps, in fact, the focus of study should not just be on the autoantibody. Here is the picture of an autoantibody, but perhaps we also should be focusing on what turns on or off the antigen. The therapy of these disorders perhaps should not just be quelling the whole immune system or getting rid of the antibody, which I'm going to talk to you about later, but perhaps silencing of the autoantigen is in order. With these in vitro studies in mind, then, we asked even more specifically, do ANCA cause disease? And to answer this question, we fulfilled the, what is now called, or called many years ago, Koch's postulates. Now, Koch 
was interested in proving that a pathogen, and in his case, that a parasite caused disease, and substitute the word parasite here with the word autoantibody. And in fact, we have fulfilled now all of the necessary prerequisites that show that in fact antibodies to myeloperoxidase cause disease. We relied again on our basic science faculty, for in fact we d were given myeloperoxidase knockout mice, in other words mice that don't have myeloperoxidase from Nibuyo Medea. And to these mice, we immunized them with mouse myeloperoxidase. Those mice that had never seen myeloperoxidase developed antibodies to myeloperoxidase. And then when we transferred the antibody from one animal to the other, that naive recipient developed glomerulonephritis and vasculitis just like humans. ANCA are not just biomarkers of disease, they cause disease. Along the way, we've made a host of other fun discoveries. Protonase 3 and myeloperoxidase both get inside of endothelial cells and alter endothelial function. We discovered that our patients are not just making antibodies to protonase 3, but also to a protein complementary to it. And that led to our theory of autoantigen complementarity as a thought process for the development of all autoimmunity. We dissected what we learned from that theory and discovered that plasminogen is yet another target of antibody response and that when these patients make an antibody to plasminogen, they clot. We've studied the genetics of our patients and we wondered why so few African Americans get this disease, why it's primarily a Caucasian disease. We learned that African American patients have an HLA genotype that's found with an odds ratio of 35. Terry, a real odds ratio. And that in fact, Patients with, who are Caucasians don't have this. But there's another message in all these science, basic and translational science studies. The basic science community has been pivotal to our progress. But so too have the PhD scientists and epidemiologists that are integral parts of clinical nephrology, parts of the faculty of the departments of medicine or pathology who are essential drivers of this work. But in the body politic of the School of Medicine, they don't necessarily get the credit they deserve. The nephropathology lab was the underpinning of our early forays into the clinical and pathological features of these diseases and is the backbone of the glomerular disease collaborative network that I'm gonna to talk to you about in a minute. Our glomerular disease and vasculitis clinic shown here is a multidisciplinary clinic that now sees as many, if fact probably more, patients with immune-mediated kidney disease than any place in the United States. Our patients participate in what are known as inception cohort studies. We follow them from their diagnosis until they die. And this has produced a treasure trove of longitudinal data that helps not only our clinical and pathological studies, but translational ones. And it is the longitudinal follow-up of these studies that has really led to our understanding that there are differences between what should now be called myeloperoxidase anca disease and protonase 3 anca disease from clinical, pathologic, genetic, and perhaps therapeutic purposes. Patients with protonase 3 anca are the ones who relapse. Myeloperoxidase anca patients don't as much. This greater understanding of vasculitis by the international community has led to the development of what's known as the Chapel Hill Consensus Conference for the nomenclature of vasculitis. And this Chapel Hill Nomenclature Conference has the worldwide standard for the definition of vasculitis. The standardization of nomenclature and the worldwide ANCA testing resulted in a large number of randomized trials that change the treatment landscape. If ANCA are really pathogenic, then if you get rid of them, patients should do better. And there are two approaches to this question. Plasmapheresis, in which antibodies are removed by a machine, turns to be most effective for severe disease. But getting rid of antibody-producing B cells should be effective. In two side-by-side -side studies in the New England Journal of Medicine, the drug rituximab that gets rid of B cells and probably plasma blasts was studied in this patient population. 
and rituximab turns out to be as effective as convention, a, conventional alkylating therapy in the treatment of these diseases and is probably better for relapsing care. We have evolved from an era of eponym to an era of understanding the disease and understanding some of its cause and targeted therapy to treat these patients. We're getting closer and closer to being able to answer the question that I think is the most common question I get as a physician, what caused my disease? We have so much more to learn, especially as it pertains to the biology of a remission and a relapse. But if Richard Morris's patient from 1985 showed up on our doorstep in 2011, she would have promptly been diagnosed as a patient with ankyovasculitis and effective therapy begun at once. Translational research is a research is a, is a labor of love. Patients and their doctors want to participate in these kinds of studies and have flocked to UNC in large numbers. There are considerable demands, both clinical and scientific, associated with the care of these patients. T cells and B cells and RNA cannot sit in somebody's coat pocket during rounds in order for them to be processed. If a patient's willing to donate tubes of their blood for these kinds of studies, it's incumbent upon the researcher to assure that the sample is processed in a manner so that the maximum output of these samples can be obtained. In our own environment, we have a dedicated, wonderful group of young investigators who really work diligently and expeditiously to make sure our samples are of the highest quality. And our regime for sample collection requires that the clinical environment where patients are seen and laboratories where patients are analyzed are relatively close. Location, 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 and easy access to patient care is of paramount importance. Another critical ingredient to success of these translational studies is the interest of healthcare providers of all stripes. In this regard, over decades, we've had exceptionally helpful help from UNC hospital clinic and hospital nurses who have always been eager to help us. And here they are sitting on 3 West. But just recently, compliance issues really threatened that longitudinal follow-up of patients, that treasure trove of longitudinal data that I just described to you. The chief compliance officer of our institution responded by combing through my 400-page NIH program project grant with me to ferret out a solution to the problem. There's no question that translational research requires a climate of creativity across the academic healthcare system. Our studies of ANCA disease began with one single case. Would this case or cases like it become the focus of investigative, investigative concern in the current age? The short answer to this question is yes, but it has become more and more difficult to be able to do innovative care in any academic hospital. And this is a consequence of a number of forces. There's declining federal support, federal NIH grants, bundled Medicare payments, waning graduate medical education support have all squeezed academic hospitals. State budgets have been forcibly shrunk and insurers look for the best quality at the lowest possible cost and have little regard for whether their members go to an academic hospital, a regional, or private community hospital. So what then is the business argument for the assertion that an academic hospital must create a climate of creativity? The technological gap between academic hospitals and outstanding community hospitals has closed. In reality, the clinical playing field has probably tipped in favor of the outstanding community hospital where clinical care is the only focus and parking is free. Some of our best and brightest trainees care for patients in these hospitals, and they do so with state-of-the-art expertise, continuing medical education, maintenance of certification, practice improvement modules, which may in fact become prerequisites for licensure, assure that these community-based docs 
are incredibly up to date. Clinical research organizations, or CROs, have figured this out as well. They are doing clinical trials in practices, and why not? They have ready access to patients. The process of developing a contract is so much less arcane than the process we have in a university. And private practitioners now garner another source of income. Across the country, and indeed across the developed world, academic healthcare systems are experiencing hurricane force swells. While schools of medicine continue to be the focus of investigative prowess, and you heard Holden Thorpe talk about how well UNC is doing, the associated academic hospitals have largely emulated the private practice model. Many such systems are not faring well, but having had the privilege of being a visiting guest at most major academic health centers in this country and many abroad, I will submit that UNC Healthcare is elegantly navigating through these difficult and troubled waters. For all of us who are clinicians in the trenches, our current healthcare system is a ever-spinning merry-go-round where physicians spend less and less time seeing each individual patient. More time is now spent charting and documenting the clinical interaction than in actually the clinical interaction in and by itself. The electronic medical record is most certainly a wonderful and time-saving, has many wonderful and time-saving attributes, but much of what is re being recorded is mind-numbing cut-and-paste drivel. The overarching effort to see more patients, to generate the profit margin, is contrary to what I think patients want. They want more face time, to use the Apple word, with their healthcare provider, not less. In an effort to sustain and grow market share, healthcare systems around the nation, including our own, are expanding hospitals and clinics to capture more market share in population centers close to the target population. This kind of expansion is akin to many commercial business models. There's a Walmart or a Target in every community, but interestingly, not a Sears, not a Borders, and certainly not a Circuit City. For those of us who grew up in the 60s and 70s, it's hard to imagine how Sears has been surpassed. How many of you in the audience, and don't raise your hand or you'll tell me your age, try to get a seat at the adult table by using the Sears and Roebuck catalog to sit on. How is it possible that that great company that was atop of the retail empire and whose management was held in the highest esteem, how have they fallen from the position of primacy? Why didn't they follow Dayton's department store and develop a Target-like spinoff? Why didn't they convert that beautiful catalog that I used to sit on into an internet-based catalog right off the bat? Why have so many companies fallen off the radar screen? And the answer to this probably lies in what Clayton Christensen describes in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. As Christensen points out, the managers of Sears were sustaining their existing customer needs and missed a number of disrupting forces. In our own business model, is our, is our own business model sustainable and expandable over the next 10 years? The answer is yes, but I believe it must be modified. There are a number of disrupting forces in the healthcare landscape. With cost containment and quality assurance as drivers, patient-centered medical homes of all stripes, from primary to specialty care, are absolutely being talked about and pursued. But let's forget for a moment this dramatic potential change in the structure of reimbursement. Long gone is the era where there were relatively a small handful of tertiary and quaternary care hospitals in our state. Now there's UNC and Duke and ECU and Carolina's Medical and Mission, and with recent affiliation, the advent of the Cleveland Clinic. All of these healthcare systems are vying for the same piece of the complex patient pie. 
For simple problems, consumers want simple and immediate solution. And these needs, I think, are being well met in urban areas by primary care providers, urgent care facilities, and more frequently now by pharmacy clinics. Pharmacy clinics are betting on the notion that the informed cons consumer will go to one of their almost drive-through clinics, get cared for, leave with their prescription, smiling and dancing, according to this ad. In all aspects of medicine, there's a renewed and healthy focus on patient needs and wants as a consequence of ferocious competition. And as an academic healthcare center, we must be getting the sickest of the sick and the most complicated of the complicated. That's who we should be focusing upon. <clears throat> For me, however, the most important and interesting disruptive force is that what has been described, I believe, first by Alvin and Heidi Toffler of Future Shock as the non expert expert. <clears throat> Let us consider what a non expert expert means in the healthcare system. And let me ask you, suppose you or a family member develop a serious illness. How would you decide where to seek care? You, if you had a regular physician, why, you would ask them. You would also call, call a friend, and I predict you would simultaneously, probably on your smartphone, Google your illness. The vast array of information on the net would be mind-boggling and confusing, but sooner or later you would find valuable and trustworthy information. If you had even rudimentary social networking skills, you would soon find a community with similar ills that would in fact provide both good and bad advice. But through this process, you would become a non-expert expert. There are, these experts are very different from experts in the media. Americans are at a complete loss at trying to understand the advice of experts on the nightly news. Those experts frequently respond to task force recommendations that may or may not be germane to the health of a specific patient. Your search will have found a very different expert. It's an expert germane to your own health, to what you need. The next critical question I think you're going to ask is as follows. I think you'd want to figure out something about the quality of the expert you have now found, their practice, and the institution in which, they're, in which you want to seek care. Consumers have an incredible and ever-expanding array of instantly available measures to inform themselves about patient, physician, and hospital quality and safety outcomes. We are all no, now rated in a manner akin to restaurants, hotels, and other boutiques. If you had a trusted physician, you'd probably ask their advice, but I predict that you may actually know more than they do about where to go. So you and your physician would take the next step, and that is to see if the expert who you have found is willing to participate with you and answer your questions by email or phone. And if you can make contact with that person, one of their colleagues or some other member of the healthcare team, you'll figure out how to make your insurance work and travel to see that patient. To have your knee replaced, your heart worked on, your eye looked at, or your vasculitis treated. It is interesting to me how we became experts in the vasculitis field. First, we've conducted a fair amount of research in the area of vasculitis, and second, we engaged and integrated kidney physicians and rheumatologists from around the southeast. That's what's called the glomerular disease collaborative network. But third, we reported and broadcast our findings through traditional approaches, publications, speaking at medical conferences, but also by interacting with patients in support group meetings, and most importantly, through our website. In 2010, we heralded the 25th anniversary of the Glomerular Disease Collaborative Network, founded in 1985 as a collaborative net effort with but 15 private practice doctors. 
The GDCN was help, formed to help explain the causes, management strategies, and treatments of specific glomerular diseases. But this is an ongoing venture, a joint venture, of academic physicians and private practice nephrologists that now number over 600, with 283 clinics spattered throughout the Southeast and elsewhere. What we have done is to actively engage in a dialogue between, our, between the academic community and private practice physicians. They know we're experts in immune-mediated kidney disease, but what we have learned, we have learned how much private practice docs want to partner with academic centers to allow their patients to get the most au courant and at times experimental care. This phenomenon should be the cornerstone on which we build similar interactions throughout all of our numerous clinical points of care. What startled me the most, however, was that despite all of our publications and all of our speaking engagements, we made little progress in migrating up and being noticed by internet search engines. Not true anymore. This is a shot to take in today from Google. And if you look at ankyovasculitis, we are right up there. But in order to get there, we address this problem by developing patient education that was targeted to the non-expert expert. And that's what changed this playing field. Initially written by doctors for patients, the information was effectively translated into English from MedSpeak by a number of people who made sure that our material was actually clearly targeting the target audience. We've made podcasts to describe very specific patient health care, care issues that have been translated into a number of languages. But it is the UNC Kidney Center website that was launched in 2007, you see the shot here, that has been really interesting with respect to how frequently it's been used in 2011 in August, as of August, there are 107,000 unique visitors with about 13,000 a month. And it is from this pool that we've seen more and more patients willing to travel to see us. I hear your refrain. Your refrain is, Ron, these are just well-educated and well-to-do patients. True, some are. Others are of very limited means but whose illness motivates their loved ones to rally support around them and to get them seen regardless of distance or cost. Academic healthcare systems must play to their strengths. They must make their facilities and their process of care as efficient, streamlined, and productive as possible while maintaining and emphasizing compassionate care. They must recognize that patient, that what patients want is to maximize provider patient face time and not provider computer monitor face time. Despite the tremendous importance of that endeavor, if that's all we do, we'll experience increasing difficulty and differentiating, differentiating ourselves from our crowded market. Our facilities will look very much like everybody else's and low cost will drive the market. Academic institutions are populated with individuals who in their very fabric want to innovate, discover, and research. UNC is fertile ground for those striving to make not just basic or clinical science discoveries, but innovations in surgery, innovations in process of care, innovations in health care delivery. This is our niche. If we don't capitalize and exploit our niche, we will may be uh, bypassing a very important op opportunity. We must exploit our niche to recruit patients who want the expert innovative care that we have now. Our hospitals and clinics should be readily differentiated from our competitors by having a broadcasting the mission of innovation and compassionate care in everything we do in word and deed. There should be no contest whether Rex Hospital or Wake Hospital have similar missions. An academic healthcare system must stimulate a climate where experts in multiple disciplines and venues 
develop, sustain, and grow regional, national, and international market share. We live in a world economy, and our health care system must participate in that process as well. Stated simply, in my opinion, we cannot cater to the patients of the past, but what I believe will be the common phenomenon of the non-expert expert patient who knows what they want and will travel to where they need to go. As part of this strategic plan, UNC Healthcare has also incorporated innovation into one of its six pillars. Let us as a community embrace innovation and tear down the walls or barriers that thwart it. Let's promote this conscious and systematic approach to assuring a climate and creativity in all we do. I hear from the podium the silent scream of appropriate worry from those of you who have made this great institution so much better. I know, I trained here. I practiced here when there was but UNC North Carolina Memorial Hospital with open wards and subpar services. I hear your distrust of the words climate of creativity as code speak for the funds flow of millions of dollars that would spew into the blowing winds without a single new patient coming to UNC. I hear your frustration that clinical research is occurring under your noses without you knowing about it, without the pride or profit derived from it, but with all of the liability for it if something goes wrong. The innovative-based research model must be met with the same degree of scrutiny as any business venture. Nor should, incidentally, the, these opportunities for innovation be limited to those in the pursuit of scientific discovery. Rather, every person at UNC Healthcare should participate in this process of innovation and wrap themselves within a climate of creative growth. This is what will effectively entice the non-expert expert patient to choose UNC as their place of care, a place that has most innovative care and can provide them with state-of-the-art and compassionate care. We're so close to achieving this vision, but we have bridges to cross. What would be the prescription to make this vision operational? I propose the creation of a position of a chief innovative innovation officer that reports directly to the CEO of the healthcare system. This person would be responsible for the development of climate of creativity across the healthcare environment. Their job would be to systematically remove barriers to innovation across our system by forging a process whereby the School of Medicine, UNC PNA, and UNC hospitals were all participants in the pride and profit of discovery. Their job would be to harness the mother load of rich resource of creating will and willing faculty, staff, and administrators who crisscross our healthcare system and so frequently don't know each other and are hidden in plain sight. Their job would be to create an environment where our substantial basic science faculty and clinical sciences could coalesce into translational medicine teams. A college of senior investigators could be formed to consider perplexing medical cases, probed by those in the community best situated to think about these critical end of one opportunities. And each one of us who care for patients should forcibly, forcibly make ourselves pause amidst the hubbub of clinical care and ask ourselves, what have we learned from that patient encounter about science and humanity? We've made many inroads in communications, mass communications, but we must develop a portal for communication with these non-expert experts, and then our experts must make portals facile for interactions with these patients and be offered time and reward for interacting with patients that may never grace our doors. Stated simply, we must 
modify to a certain amount our current way of doing business and capitalize on our greatest strengths. We can do this. And we can do it well within the Carolina tradition of hospitality and collegiality. Let's take this next step and make UNC Healthcare a place where compassionate care and innovative care are commonplace and in so doing be the leading public academic healthcare system in our nation. Thank you very much. Ron, I said in the beginning, uh, in, in your introduction, that we are all better for your being among us, and I think you will all agree with that. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. This is a special part of the life of the medical school, and uh, we have refreshments in the back, and would love to have you linger and visit, and if you are looking for something to say, just remember, antineutrophil, cytoplasmic, autoantibodies. <laughs> thank you so much for coming.